76,000 total apprehensions in a four week month in February, both a border security and a humanitarian crisis. It is Wednesday, March 6th, coming straight from the Border Patrol chief, who says there is a growing crisis along our southern border. Yeah, faced with some real and pretty impressive numbers, Democrats, though, still are not buying it. We're live in Washington with the lengths that they're now going to block the emergency declaration. Mrs. Clover, can you tell me why you were flying today? Oh, yeah, because I needed to go to work. D.C. to New York, the mile-high hypocrisy of AOC. The move her critics are calling just plain wrong. And apparently everyone gets a book deal these days. How you can take home your very own copy of Bob Mueller's Russia report? It's not out yet. Fox & Friends First continues right now. Let us hope. That's what they said. I recall a blizzard here in New York two years ago on April 1st. I think two years let's ago. Not, let's not yeah. rewind. Let's not talk about that. Good morning. <laughs> You're watching Fox & Friends First on this Wednesday morning. I'm Rob Schmidt. And I'm Jillian Mealy. As always, thanks so much for starting your day with us. Let's begin with this. Customs and Border Patrol is at a breaking point. That grim warning is Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen prepares for questioning on Capitol Hill today. Yeah, Griff Jenkins joins us live from Washington as we learn 76,000 people tried to cross our border just last month, Griff, and that's just the amount that they caught, right? There could have been even more. That's right, Robin Jillian. Good morning. These numbers are really quite uh, stunning. Secretary Nielsen is going to be urging lawmakers before the House Homeland Security uh, uh, Committee to heed what Customs and Border Protection says are alarming early numbers. Here, how CBP's commissioner put it yesterday. Based on the experiences the of men top. and women on the front line, this is clearly both a border security and humanitarian crisis. The system is well beyond capacity and remains at a breaking point. Now, according to the CBP data, they're seeing a 300 percent increase in the number of family units apprehended this year compared to last year. In fact, in the first five months of fiscal year 19, they've already had 136,150, exceeding the total number for all of fiscal year 18, which is 107,212. Now, overall, apprehensions are up 97 percent along the southwest border. But these large groups we've been seeing uh, crossing, there have been 70 large groups of 100 or more individuals, totaling more than 12,000 apprehensions so far. That compares to only 13 groups last year and only two in 2017. More are also on the way. Now, Mexico's Interior Secretary Olga Cordero was in D.C. last week. I went and listened to her speak. She warned that these caravans are a new phenomenon that she fears is going to bring more than 700,000 Central American migrants to Mexico, and that means on our border. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence was touring a DEA facility in Phoenix yesterday and had this to say. The truth is the crisis on our southern border today uh, is overwhelming our system. Any vote against the president's national emergency declaration is a vote against border security. And that vote is coming with enough Republican defections to block the president's declaration. But Democrats continue opposing the use of any military funds being used for the border. Uh, devoting OCO funds to a useless, reckless vanity project at the border would betray our national security and our commitment to our men and women in uniform. Now, that vote, by the way, is probably going to happen before March 15th, we're hearing. But meanwhile, CBP officials and Secretary Nielsen hope that all lawmakers will take a harder look at these numbers and maybe change their thoughts. Obviously Guys? All right, Griff Jenkins, live in Washington. Thanks, Griff. A security check takes a tragic turn when a police officer is shot and killed. A homeowner opening fire on officer Nathan Heidelberg, thinking he was a burglar. The five-year department veteran shot right above his bulletproof vest in Midland, Texas. We're hurting to the core right now. This is the first officer in, in uh, well over 30 years uh, that the Midland Police Department has lost. Um, and so it, it's shaking us to the core. First responder saluting Officer Heidelberg in a police procession. The man who shot him, David Charles Wilson, is charged with manslaughter. 
Now to a Fox News alert. Brand new satellite images appear to show North Korea strengthening its nuclear arsenal. Analysts believe the regime is rebuilding a launch site just days after President Trump's failed summit with Kim Jong-un. National Security Advisor John Bolton warning of consequences if North Korea doesn't denuclearize. And I think President Trump has been very clear they're not going to get relief from the crushing economic sanctions that have been imposed on them. Uh, and we'll look at ramping those sanctions up. Negotiations with North Korea are expected to continue. House Democrats postpone a vote to condemn anti-Semitism after pressure from progressives. The resolution initially seen as a response to Minnesota Democrat Ilhan Omar's anti-Israel comments. It will now condemn anti-Muslim bias as well. Mike Emanuel has more on the Democratic division. Lawmakers have heard enough from Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. So the House is expected to vote on a resolution condemning anti-Semitism, though it doesn't mention her by name. A draft obtained by Fox acknowledges the dangerous consequences of perpetuating anti-Semitic stereotypes and rejects anti-Semitism as hateful expressions of intolerance that are contradictory to the values that define the people of the United States. Leading Republicans say that's not enough. If they really are serious about addressing the problem, Nancy Pelosi has to remove her from the Foreign Affairs Committee. Ilhan Omar tweeted over the weekend, being opposed to Netanyahu and the occupation is not the same as being anti-Semitic. New York Democrat Nita Lowy blasted Omar, urging her to retract. Lawmakers must be able to debate without prejudice or bigotry. I am saddened that Representative Omar continues to mischaracterize support for Israel. Omar fired back, I should not be expected to have allegiance pledge support to a foreign country in order to serve my country in Congress or serve on committee. A leading Democrat warns lawmakers must choose their words carefully. We are hurting people at times with our language, but we've got to protect everybody's freedom of religion. A Trump campaign advisor took a much harsher tone with Omar. I'm going to say that she is filth. She has no place in the Congress. Jumping to Omar's defense, fellow freshman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. If we called resolutions on sexist statements, a good chunk of Congress would be gone. This has exposed serious friction between some veteran lawmakers and these new high-profile freshmen, some clearly thinking this doesn't go far enough, suggesting Congressman Omar should be called out by name. On Capitol Hill, Mike Emanuel, Fox News. Michael Cohen back on Capitol Hill today. As it's revealed, his attorney tried securing a presidential pardon. After the FBI raided Cohen's home, his attorney approached President Trump's lawyers to discuss the possibility. The president's team apparently shot the idea down. Cohen, who was sentenced to three years in prison for lying, will testify behind closed doors today. The former Trump attorney also testified last week against his former boss. Cohen had said in the past that he didn't ask for and wouldn't accept a presidential pardon. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib will join protesters today as Democrats increase calls for President Trump's impeachment. Two advocacy groups tell The Hill the Michigan Democrat will deliver remarks on the, quote, need to address the crisis presented by Donald Trump's administration. Protesters will then head to the office of an unnamed lawmaker. Top Democrats are urging members to stop impeachment calls until the Mueller Russia probe is released. The state of California doesn't want to give the United States its money back. The state fighting President Trump's threats to pull billions of dollars in federal funding uh, from its failed high-speed rail project to reclaim that money. State officials say taking the money back would be disastrous. Last month, the White House announced it would explore every legal option to get $2.5 billion back. Today, Christians around the world will celebrate Ash Wednesday, one of the holiest days of the year. It marks the beginning of Lent, a six-week period of fasting and repentance leading up to Easter. And millions will receive the traditional ashes on their foreheads today. Pope Francis is preparing in Rome for Mass at the Basilica of Santa Sabina at 10.30 Eastern Time. Mm -hmm. It is nine minutes after the hour. Criminal or just incredibly stupid, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her chief of station accused of moving nearly $1 million in donations of the books. Did they know what they were doing? Republican strategist Ned Ryan knows exactly how campaigns work. He is here to break down the allegations. And ever wish you could go back to school or could have maybe just stayed there longer? The city where students could soon be forced to go for 13 years. There is 
that's no violation, so there's no violation. Do you think that's a sign of you taking dark money? Oh, no. No. I'm 100% Thank you. AOC denying the dark money allegations leveled against her in a federal elections complaint. A conservative watchdog group is accusing the freshman congresswoman and her chief of staff of nearly $1 million off the books operation. Ned Ryan is the founder and CEO of American Majority, which specializes in grassroots campaigning. Uh, Ned, you're the perfect person to ask about this. Explain exactly what is alleged here and is this an easy mistake to make? I, I got to tell you guys, I, th this is either incredibly stupid and naive or it's deeply calculated, neither of which are good scenarios. You cannot have a candidate and her chief of staff controlling a PAC that is working on behalf of electing that candidate. I mean, this is campaign 101. You cannot coordinate at any level. And I think there's a couple different issues here at stake. Uh, if there was improper uh, disclosure of independent expenditures, if there were illegal in-kind contributions to benefit the campaign, if there was potential coordination, those are all fines. You, you will definitely, they will definitely get fined on, on, on those things. I think the biggest question is, did AOC and her chief of staff willingly and knowingly try to hide their control of this pack? And if they did so, that's when you start to talk about jail time. Yeah, but even if it was a mistake, just for argument's sake, is that still okay? No, it's not okay. You're, they're going to get fined. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if this is provable and it looks very suspicious, again, with these potential in-kind contributions and potential coordination, I mean, Jillian, this is campaign 101. You cannot coordinate because of the limits in federal elections with PACs versus campaigns. I'm staggered to think that someone thought that a candidate could be on the actual board of the PAC and her chief of staff as it's working on behalf of that campaign. And the thing that's really suspicious to me, guys, they took control of this pack in December of 2017. They did not lose control of it until August of 2018. In between, AOC happens to win her primary. And again, in that district, if you win, win the primary, you basically won right. the general. Very suspicious timing. Yeah, the, the primary was the whole thing. Once, once you got the nomination, you were good to go. Um, what do you think that's right. the defense will be, Ned? What, in their minds right now, how are they going to con concoct a defense to this? What are they going to say? Well, I mean, if, it, if it's naivety and stupidity, I, I have a hard time believing the FEC is going to look at that and go, and we're not talking insignificant amounts of money, again, almost a million dollars. Uh, but, but I think the thing that's interesting, again, to me, Rob, is this. We, we have AOC, who's just sanctimoniously moralizing to us about climate change, and then she has this massive carbon footprint, and then she's lectured us on dark money in politics, and it looks like she is potentially, and I think per probably is, guilty of doing the exact same thing. She's just another sanctimonious hypocrite. Okay, so let's talk about um, the Green New Deal, which we know would <laughs> potentially eliminate um, air travel. And <laughs> just listen to the soundbite uh, of a reporter asking Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez why she was flying. Can you tell me why you were flying today? Oh, yeah, because I needed to go to work. All right, and then um, what is the difference between you taking a flight and train them? Okay, um, a couple hours of my constituents' time. Hmm. Presuming she was going from New York to D.C., there are trains that do that. Well, I mean, listen, guys, if the world's going to end in 12 years, you have to maximize every hour, okay? <laughs> every hour counts. But for someone that wants to outlaw planes, she sure seems to like them a lot. I mean, I saw a statistic. I think she's seven times more likely to use a plane than a train. I probably use trains more coming from yep. D.C. to New York City. But again, this, this just goes back to these, these global change Puritans, they want to virtue signal, they want to be emotionally right, but you know, what's a few million cubic tons of CO2 between friends as long as your heart's in the right place? I just, again, it goes back to the hypocrisy, not only of AOC, but these others that are jet setting around the world, lecturing us on man-made global warming, and they are guilty of the exact same behavior that they are lecturing us on. And what's the, I mean, what, what is the straight shot to DC on a train from New York? I've taken that train. It's two and a half, two three, and a half hours. three hours. Yeah. You go to the yeah. airport, you I go mean, through you, security, it, you got to get there an hour, the hour and a half time. before the flight. It takes the same amount of time. Yeah. I mean, it's That's, unbelievable I, that I she choose. would give that kind of ammunition <laughs> to the other side, because that is just the best ammunition you can get. 
Now, Rob, I usually choose to take either the train or I drive because you're right, going to the airport, parking, going through security, hopping on the plane, all that, it's just as much time and it's a lot much more of a pain to actually do that where, you know, it's two and a half hours, two hours and 45 minutes, I think, on the Acela, a little bit longer on the Nor'easter. But this is, this is one of the things where it's just, again, you have to be kidding me. That's your best excuse. I'm trying to save a couple hours. Uh, for constituents' time, uh, it, it, it doesn't pass the smell test. Again, the other thing I'd point out too, I think you use $30,000 on Uber and only $8,000 on subway tickets. When I come to New York, I choose to use the subway because it's more convenient and it gets and me it's faster fast, and yeah. saves me on traffic time. It, it boggles the mind. In a city connected by trains, <laughs> she takes cars. And let's not forget, you can't take That's all right. of your liquids if yeah. you fly. So there's that. Ned, right. thank you. <laughs> of course. Thanks, guys. It is, hairspray is important. It yeah. is 18 minutes after the hour. It was a vicious attack on a conservative on campus. Now justice is one step closer to being served. The new charges just filed. And they went head to head in 2016, but the back and forth is far from over between the president and Hillary Clinton. This was actually pretty funny from both of them. Carly Schiff is here with the online reaction pouring in. Good morning and welcome back. Nancy Pelosi caves to pressure from the breakout stars of the far left, postponing today's vote on a resolution to condemn Ilhan Omar's anti-Semitic remarks. And Omar had a little help from her friends to convince the House Speaker. Carly Shimkus with Fox News Headlines 24-7, Sirius XM 115, here with the reaction online. Hey, good morning, guys. Another day, another round of Ocasio-Cortez tweets. This time, she's taking an interesting approach to the whole Ilhan Omar controversy. Uh, she's essentially calling out Democrats for condemning anti-Semitism, saying there have been other instances of racism that they haven't called out. Here's her tweet on this one. She says... One of the things that is hurtful about the extent to which reprimand is sought of Ilhan is that no one seeks this level of reprimand when members make statements about Latinx and other communities. During the shutdown, a GOP member yelled, go back to Puerto Rico on the floor. Well, there is one major problem with that tweet that Guy Benson was quick to point out, saying the member who yelled about Puerto Rico was referring to a pack trip taken by a number of Dems in the midst of the government shutdown. So he's saying it wasn't a racist incident. It was remember when the Democrats went to Puerto Rico during the government shutdown. Yes. That's why this uh, GOP congressman said, go back to Puerto Rico. So not a member, of, not an instance of racism. Stephen on Twitter also says uh, yet another instance of people in power caring more for the people of the privilege than those uh, who are disenfranchised. So uh, the House will likely vote on this uh, resolution tomorrow, and it will include uh, language that also condemns um, anti-Muslim rhetoric right. as well. The fact that they try to use the Puerto Rico thing, I mean, that was the, yeah. the I mean, vacation that all the Republicans were talking about. And it was right after that. It was so clear that that's yeah. what was being emphasized there. Um, Absolutely. What's, uh, what's Melania up to? All right. Well, uh, she uh, is calling out the media for their press coverage, saying they need to focus more on important issues and less on outrage over her husband. Take a listen. I challenge the press to devote as much time to the lives lost and the potential lives that could be saved by dedicating the same amount of coverage that you do to idle gossip or tribal stories. Well, some see this challenge as a no-win situation, including this person on Instagram who says the mainstream media will interpret this challenge to mean they have to sneer and mock Melania even more. Another commenter chiming in saying, what great insight, the true reflection of a fabulous first lady. So there you have it on that one. So this one uh, was kind of funny. I guess this is when Twitter is at its funniest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Back at it again. So President Trump and Hillary Clinton taking jabs at each other on Twitter. It all started when President Trump tweeted this. Crooked Hillary Clinton confirms she will not run in 2020, rolls out a third bid for White House. Aw, oh, shucks. Does that mean I won't get to run against her again? She will be sorely missed. Well, Hillary Clinton responded with this mean <laughs> girl's gif that says, why are you so obsessed with me? Doesn't it feel like 2016 all over yeah, again? It's great. It's a comfortable place for Regina yeah. George. I miss those days. Yeah. Great barbs. All right. Carly, thank, thank you. you so much. Appreciate it, guys. 25 minutes after the hour, lawmakers demanding answers after high schoolers get punished for wearing MAGA gear in the halls of their school. Arizona State Representative Kelly Townsend is one of those lawmakers, and she's going to be here live with us. Stay tuned. Yeah. And a free pass for getting high. It's happening in New York City schools. Dr. Nicole Sapphire says that sends a terrible message to parents everywhere. She joins us live right now. 
All right, welcome back. A look at the top headlines this morning. Today, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen will testify before House Democrats on uh, the crisis at the border, what the administration is calling it. It comes as newly released members numbers uh, by the CBP show more than 76,000 people tried and were caught crossing our border just in the month of February. 76,000. Border Patrol officials warning this points to a border security and humanitarian crisis. And President Trump just approved disaster aid for Alabama in the wake of deadly tornadoes there. At least 23 people are dead, seven from the same family, and a half dozen still missing. The president heads to Lee County Friday to tour the devastation. And today the president will meet with the former Yemeni hostage in the Oval Office, a former hostage, Texas oil worker, Danny Birch was recently reunited with his family. He spent 18 months held captive by rebel firefighters after he was kidnapped in that Arab nation. The United Arab Emirates is at war with Yemen and was instrumental in securing his release back to the United States. Welcome home. Let's talk about this. New York City students getting a free pass on grass. If See caught did there? with, uh, yes, very, yeah. Uh, if caught with marijuana, on campus, teens are now getting warning cards instead of any other kind of uh, punishment. Unbelievable. Joining us to discuss the health hazards of pot and what kind of message this sends to our kids is Fox News medical contributor, Dr. Nicole Sapphire. Thank you for being here with us. Good morning, guys. Uh, when you heard this, what did you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, New York is well on its way to be an 11th state of legalizing marijuana. So, you know, we'll already be seeing this. But for me, this is just another free pass for children. And it's almost increasing the acceptance of marijuana. Yeah. It's great in the sense that we don't want these young children to have permanent criminal records. And so what they're trying to do is decriminalize it so that they aren't prejudiced against their entire life. However, are we saying to them now, if we don't give them a criminal summons, that this is okay, you're just going to get a slap on the hand. Even when marijuana is legalized, it's not legal in under 21. And when New York passes, which is probably going to this year, uh, they've said, Como has said, 21 and older. So again, still children. We know that marijuana affects the brains. Brains are developing until the age of 25, okay? My, my kids don't think they, that's true. They think they know everything right now. But the, <laughs> the point is, the brains are still developing until 25. And marijuana absolutely has effect on brain development. It can increase anxiety and psychoses in teenagers. And one in six kids who use it regularly will be addicted to it. And some people wonder about it being a gateway drug. Right. Well, you know what? The gateway theories have been disproven over and over again. There's still some conspiracy theory there. Yes. Will it lead to more hardcore drugs down the road? Just studying marijuana effect leading to that, the answer is probably not. Okay. Yeah. But if you are doing illegal activity, it is more likely that you are to do more illegal activity mm -hmm. in the future. But it's a heck of a drug as it is, especially the marijuana that's being produced today is it's powerful stuff. Let, let's take a look real quick at how the city's going to handle this before you respond. Uh, parents going to be notified about pot infractions. Uh, nothing will remain on the student's record. The discipline is going to range from a lecture to possibly a suspension. Compare that to what it was when we were kids. You got caught smoking grass in school. I mean, well, look out. Is this going to be the same for alcohol, for cigarettes? Are they being yeah. um, loose on pot, but not for other things? You know, we want to make sure that there's a uniform response there, and it is not them allowing it to happen. Because the truth is, the marijuana today kids are getting is very different than what it was a couple decades ago. It is significantly higher in THC, the getting high chemical, and also it's laced with a lot of things. So no, I'm not okay with them saying to kids essentially, you know what, this is just a little slap on the hand. There has to be some hardcore infractions or punishment. And maybe they don't need to be criminal, but I want to see the schools stepping in to make sure that they are sending the message, this is not okay. When I was in high school, I used to get uh, demerits for wearing the wrong shoes. <laughs> and crazy. now look what's going it's on. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Doc. Thank Appreciate you. it. <laughs> All right, let's check in on the, the freezing, frigid, horrible <laughs> weather outside with Janice. Hi, Janice. Yeah, that is the bottom line. You nailed it. It is cold outside. Feels like winter. Here's the wind chill as far south as the Gulf Coast into the teens and the 20s here. So we have freeze warnings in effect from Texas all the way up towards South Carolina and everywhere in between. 
between along the Gulf Coast. So freeze warnings, meaning that it's going to be below freezing for a period of several hours. And then your wind chill radar here as we go through time, you know, getting into the 40s, maybe the 50s across portions of Texas, still in the 30s uh, for Mississippi and Alabama up towards Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so this cold is going to remain in place for the next couple of days. Then we're going to watch our next big weather maker that's going to move across much of the country, going to bring heavy rain and mountain snow once again to some of these areas that have been inundated. Uh, it's a good news, bad news story. They need the rain out here, but flash flooding is going to be a concern. And we also have travel concerns. But if you're a skier, I think ultimately this yeah. is a pretty good forecast. Ah, right, Rob, Jillian? You're, you're, making the most, you're making the mostly sunny out of that. I, <laughs> I see what you did there. And I think. <laughs> we're all reading the book. <laughs> Janice, thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. Okay, so you forgot what? Uber releasing a list of the 50 most unique items left behind by riders. Some of them will surprise you. The company listing an eight week old chihuahua as the most unique item left behind. Somebody left their dog in the car. The Aww. list also includes a six piece of chicken tenders from 7 Eleven, a set of gold teeth, a signed Babe Ruth wow. uh, baseball card, or baseball, I should say. And dirty laundry. That's interesting. Yeah. The most common items left behind were phones, cameras, wallets, keys, and purses. I have left a camera yeah. and a jacket in a cab once, not an Uber. I've left the ear pods, the Apple ear pods. I was mm. so ticked off. Yeah. To replace those. All right, 35 minutes. Of course, I never got them back. 35 minutes after the hour. Uh, can't wait to see what's in Bob Mueller's report. Now you can pre order it on Amazon. We're going to explain. And actor Danny DeVito falls flat on his face. We're coming right back. If you're having a good morning so far, welcome back. Amazon is selling Robert Mueller's Russia report even before it comes out. Yes, you can order uh, pre-order the book titled The Mueller Report with an introduction by Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. The book's release date is March 26th. It's not clear if Attorney General William Barr has officially cleared the report for release. Interesting. The Dershowitz intro is very interesting. Yeah. Okay, Senator Bernie Sanders signs a pledge to run for president as a Democrat. The registered independent promising to serve the party if elected. The DNC put a new rule in place last year saying anyone seeking the Democratic nomination must be a Democrat. It came after Sanders' uh, failed presidential bid back in 2016. Socialist policies like free college and Medicare for all are a major component of the left's 2020 platform, as you know. National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow says Democrats will work overtime to twist the economic message, playing the recession card during a time of intense prosperity for this country. I'm putting socialism on trial, and I'm going to convict it as well. On this business about they don't pay their fair share, if you actually look at the facts and figures, the top 1% pays almost 40% of the income taxes. The top 10% pays about 70%. The bottom 50% pays less than 3%. I mean, we have the most progressive tax code of any of the large industrial countries around the world. So it's just factually completely incorrect. But here's another point. You should be incentivized. You should get rewarded for your hard work and your investment and your risk taking. This is one of the great things President Trump has done. He has ended the war on business. He has stopped punishing success. And he has said to men and women, go out, take a rip at the ball, buy your own company and start producing and, and creating jobs. That's the new face of the Trump economy. A brand new Gallup poll also shows President Trump's approval rating on the economy hitting a new high of 56 <laughs> percent. All right. The NSA's controversial program monitoring Americans, Americans calls and text messages has been quietly shut down. That according to a Republican congressional aide. Tracy Carrasco from our sister network Fox Business explains why. What's this about, Tracy? Good morning, guys. Yeah, so this is the program that was pretty controversial, raised a lot of debates and questions after it went into effect following the September 11, 2001 attacks. The Trump administration may not renew the uh, legal authority, which is set to expire at the end of the year. So the NSA says they, hasn't, they haven't used this program in several months now, according to the New York Times. They say they haven't used it, that this is the program that does monitor Americans' call logs, their texts. So since they haven't used it, they might not renew that. But this program was disclosed back in 2013 by Edward Snowden. You'll remember that, of course, brought a lot of awareness to people that uh, this was happening and that your privacy might be in jeopardy.
Okay, so what's this about uh, an airline offering like something like forty or forty nine dollar tickets to Hawaii flights yes. to Hawaii? Southwest, they are finally starting their trips to Hawaii. They've been trying to do this for some time. So to introduce the flights, they have some low fares, $49 one way. So round trip, less than $100. Of course, these introductory rates already sold out the first flight from California to Honolulu, Hawaii, starting on March 17th. But of course, the other competitors had to get in on the action. Alaska Airlines, they had fares as low as $198. Eight round trip, United. Uh, there are another one, Hawaiian Airlines as well. So if you want to check out a cheap flight to Hawaii, maybe now is a good yeah. time with Southwest getting in the field there. Yeah, hot toddies there right now. Yep. We should mention that. Lucky him. <laughs> and it's been a rough couple weeks for Southwest, so there's some yep. good news for them. All right, uh, Peeps <laughs> unveiling uh, some new products just in time. For spring. The yes, Easter Peeps. staples. Oh. Peeps has unveiled 20 new products for this spring, and more than 66% of American parents, they put together an Easter basket for their kids. No doubt, most of them do include Peeps. So we have some of the new flavors here. Uh, we have cotton candy, that is the pink one. They're pretty. Rip your float. Maple <laughs> pancakes and maple Ooh. syrup. Uh, yes, blue raspberry. Uh -huh. Also some Peeps chocolate bars, some Jelly beans as well, orange sherbet, vanilla cream. Okay. So lots of new flavors this year. Easter, of course, on April 21st. And what's your flavor of choice? You know what? I'm going to try the vanilla cream. Okay. I'm going with the chocolate because yeah. I can't eat peeps, actually. Rob? I, uh, I can eat peeps. I choose not to. This actually has vanilla cream on the bottom. Really? What? Yes. Get... It's, it's very good. You know, kids like these things, I think. I don't know. I've... It was my favorite Easter snack when I was a it's Try just, the rip your flip. Just Come on, good. It's kind of weird to me. <laughs> Try it. I mean, what is this? It's sugar and marshmallow. Oh, God. Shaped like a chick. I like chocolate. <laughs> Torturing him or something. My goodness. Give me some of that chocolate. I like that. Give me that. Okay. There we go. All, All right, right, Tracy. We tried it. We gave it a shot. Thank you. Kids love them, though. <laughs> Give them for your kids. It is 16 minutes until the top of the hour. Did a high school violate students' rights over their support for the president? That's what a group of Arizona Republicans want to know. Our next guest, State Representative Kelly Townsend, is one of them. She says no one should be silenced over their politics. All right, but first let's check in with Steve Ducey, see what's coming up on Fox and Friends. Steve, we got like 40 peeps here for you. Uh, yeah, Rob, you've got peeps in your teeth, right? Right there. Right there. Yeah. Get it. You got it. There we go. It, they look delicious, just saying. <laughs> hey, uh, coming up on the program, three hours, uh, where we're talking about the news of the day. In fact, that's our lead story, Breaking Point. Uh, 76,000 crossed the border illegally in February alone. That is a 100% increase year over year. What's going on? We're going to talk to all sorts of people this morning. But that in the news of the day, including White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. We've got New York Congressman Lee Zeldin uh, speaking about this anti-Semitic resolution that was supposed to be voted on, we thought, yesterday. And maybe today, maybe tomorrow. We don't know. Geraldo Rivera, as well. Is going to look into the opioid problem in this country. Also, a dean has resigned over a school's opposition to Chick fil A's corporate values, cited her Christian beliefs in her resignation announcement. So, uh, why did she decide to quit over Chick fil A? We're going to tell you her story and so much more. Robin Gillian, we got a busy three hours, kicks off just about 14 minutes from right now here on the channel. Everybody trusts for their morning news. I could definitely go for some Chick fil A right now. I could, I could imagine that. Let's get some. Some of that. Yeah. All right. Steve, Delicious. thank you. <laughs> right to support President Trump at school if they choose. Arizona Republicans are demanding an answer after students were punished for wearing Make America Great Again gear on campus. Kelly Townsend is one of the state representatives looking for an answer, and she joins me now. Thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, how, what type of uh, response do you think you're going to get from this? Well, I, we already have uh, some action happening right now. And that, you know, there's some questions about the various versions of the story that we were hearing. Mm -hmm. And there's attorneys that are now involved. And one of those attorneys has issued a retraction 
for the school because the school said that before the video started that the mother came into the classroom or into the school yelling, uh, using the F word at, in front of students. And the attorney has issued a demand for a retraction because there was actually more to that video that was cut off because there was other students in the video, so the mother didn't want to release that. But it shows it from the moment she got out of her car and went into the building. There was no yelling. There was no cursing or F-bomb. The school chose to fabricate um, a story about this mother in an effort to discredit her. Well, and so because of that reason and many others, we think we need to get to the bottom of it, so we've asked the Attorney General to investigate. So a little background for folks who are joining us right now. It was a spirit day at this school and the theme was party in the USA and some students were disciplined as a result of this. Let's go ahead and listen to one of those students. Everyone's still allowed to have their own political view, but you shouldn't, that shouldn't affect the way you treat a student and how you discipline a student. So let me ask you, do you think, what's your opinion, do you think high school students should be able to, to wear this gear and, and, and show their support at school? Well, I don't think it matters what I think. I think it matters what the Supreme Court thinks. And in a 7-2 to two decision that students do have pure speech rights where they can express themselves on their shirts. You know, if they want to wear a, a shirt with a cross, if they want to wear a shirt that says Trump, if they want to sh wear a shirt that says Obama, they do have that right. And what the problem is, is that when someone that's in a position of authority is offended by that pure speech, they have the power to retaliate, to punish, to treat badly these kids and, and to make them take the shirt off and tell them they need to leave the property of the school because they had a flag that they didn't want. So, and you, you can hear in the video him specifically saying, you have a flag that we didn't want, you need to leave. And, and that's wrong. So the Arizona Attorney General did issue a response, a uh, rather short response, but here it is anyway, and it says, quote, we received the letter. We'll look at all of the facts. We just don't know enough about the situation right now. Uh, what happens next? Okay, I think it's really important that everyone begins to have the conversation about what the First Amendment is and what we do to deal with situations when we see something we don't like, when we hear something we don't like. I'm hearing a lot of people saying, well, let's just ban everything altogether so that there's not these problems. But that's not what the First Amendment's for. The First Amendment is to protect the undesirable speech. We wouldn't need it if there was an yeah. undesirable speech. So, so we have to accept that and understand that people have that right and not react in a violent way to make it unsafe because we have people being violent over MAGA hats and those types of things and what they're doing is stifling other people's right. freedom Sorry. of speech out of fear of, of retaliation. I just want to interrupt you real quick because we only have a couple seconds and I'm curious, have you ever seen another time in our country's history where this has been a problem trickling down into even high schools? It, it's it's really bad. I think because there's a lack of knowledge of what our rights are. We were earlier talking about the NSA, you know, out of fear of terrorism, we've stifled your Fourth Amendment rights. Out of fear of mass shootings, we're stifling your Second Amendment rights. And out of fear of people having basically a reaction where they may become violent, now we're stifling your First Amendment rights. I think it's time for America to really go back and open up the Constitution, read it, understand what that means. And it's an uncomfortable thing, but, you know, the price of freedom it is, is just that and we have to accept that there's risks there's there's uncomfortable things yeah. that we have to deal with but that's our country we appreciate that's you taking the time this morning representative kelly townsend thank you, you. Bet. we're coming right back thank you A new push to extend high school by one year. A Boston City Councilman says his 13th grade proposal would, uh, would help low-income students better prepare for college and make them more competitive. He says the school year would be optional. It would only be offered to high school graduates. Boston's Democratic mayor says he's going to review hmm. this idea. One more year of high school. Yes, what you thought, if this was a good idea or not, or a waste of time. Your comments have been pouring in. Salvatore on Facebook says, as a high school teacher, I can tell you this will not make any difference. In fact, I think it will make things worse, higher dropout rates for one, as it's not the amount of time, but how wisely they use the time. Hmm. Michael on Instagram writes, good idea, maybe incorporate mindfulness and meditation. And Donna on Facebook says, if you can't get 1 through 12 right, why waste tax dollars on another year? Hmm.
Ooh, I couldn't wait to go to college and get out of the house. <laughs> Time for the good, the bad, and the ugly. As always, we start with the good. A dog and an infant fight for their soldier dad's attention. You've got to see this. <laughs> 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 Hi. Oh, that's great. Caroline the dog nudging baby Savannah out of the way to get to dad. Soldier Billy Red Heifer had just gotten home to Pennsylvania after military drills. Just feeling the love. <laughs> I like that. Next to bad, whore on the high seas, powerful gusts of wind, uh, injures passengers on a cruise ship. People on board the Norwegian Escape say it tilted to its side, sending furniture oh. flying after leaving New York on Sunday. Officials blame a sudden gust of 115 Jeez. mile per hour wind, 115 miles per hour. The ship safely arriving in Port Canaveral, Florida. Wow. Scary. And the ugly actor Danny DeVito's appearance in Mexico falls flat, literally. Oh, that's sad. DeVito taking a tumble during a news conference for his upcoming movie, Dumbo. The 74-year-old is okay. Look, I fall a lot. I broke the same ankle four times, so I feel you, man. <laughs> we like Danny DeVito. <laughs> be all right. Fox and Friends starts right now. Well, first of all, I really don't believe anything that comes out of Hillary's mouth. So she says she's not running, but then again, when it comes to Hillary, who really knows? But, you know, beyond that, I think Trump really is disappointed. He doesn't get to run against her. I think that she would be a very easy win for him. But then again, I think that all the Democrats that are lined up will also be a very easy win for him. So, Hillary, we know you're going to stick around. We know you're going to keep talking. And quite honestly, it probably does a service to the Republican Party more so than the Democrats if you do. Oh, well, it started a Twitter war. This and Hillary Clinton, she uh, she sent out a gif from the movie Mean Girls. Watch this, and then we'll show you a clip from the movie and get your reaction. This She'd be like, why didn't you call me back? And I'd be like, why are you so obsessed with me? Why are you she, so obsessed with me? That's the, tweeted, that's the line from the movie. And there's the well, gif really that, she, that, she should say, that she sent out. Go ahead. Well, it's really funny that she should say that Trump is obsessed with her, given that she can't give a speech without mentioning him. And that goes for all the Democrats. They're actually quite obsessed with Donald Trump. If you think about it, when have they ever been able to do anything or advocate for any policy position that wasn't anti-Trump? All right. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk a little bit about this. This is a story that online has gone viral. You know how Forbes magazine always comes out with the list of the richest people in the world. Uh, they are they have named Kylie Jenner uh, at age 21 as uh, ranking with some of the world's richest people. And they say and this is the part that has got everybody uh, <laughs> so crazy. If we could put that graphic up once again, that she's a self made billionaire because, you know, you think about the Kardashian family, they have a lot of money and they got a lot of fame and people online are going, she's not self-made, Tommy. Yeah, well, I mean, I understand the, the critique there, but this is really deeper than that. People are attacking her. They're attacking her wealth. They're attacking the fact that she's not self-made. And really what this is is the continuation of the demonization of wealth. It's something the Democratic Party pushes day in and day out. And Kylie Jenner is just another target of that. It's if you have more money than me, then somehow you don't deserve it. It should be taken away from you. You're not self-made. It's a continual attack on people with money, people with wealth. And quite honestly, Honestly, Kylie Jenner and her tax dollars are subsidizing a lot of these people who sit on Twitter all day and talk about her. So at the end of the day, they should be quite thankful. Yeah, good for her. But I was kind of shocked out of all the Kardashians, Tommy, weren't you kind of shocked? I mean, the mother was their manager. Kim Kardashian's so famous. All the sisters are so, fa so famous. She's probably the one that's not out there as much. And she's the one that's the billionaire because of her makeup line. Well, exactly. It just goes to show that, yes, she was given a head start in life because of the way she was brought up and her family, but she's been able to go out and create an empire. That's and right. Kylie Cosmetics is something that's done incredibly well. She's been able to use a passion of hers and make a ton of money doing it, making more money than Kim, making more money than her mom and any of the other like Kardashians. Sister, so yeah. good for her. Maybe she's not self-made, but she's really killing it. And I say, keep going, keep going, girl. Yeah, I mean, she sat back and said, okay, I see all what's going on here. No, Let me I'm find my do way, my own thing. do my own thing More and make my own money. More successful than all of them. Of course. But you know who gets the last laugh? 
Kylie Jenner is a billionaire. Laughing all the way to the bank. All right. Thanks, Tommy. Tommy, Uh, thanks a lot. uh, Check out Tommy on Fox Nation. If you don't already have the app, I know we're all on it as well. Go to foxnation.com. Check out your free subscription. Her her first thoughts and final thoughts every day on Fox Nation. It just kills me, this attitude of you have so much and now I'm mad at you. I'm jealous of you because you have so much and you've done well and worked hard. It's a debate just being over, happy for someone. It's a debate over the term self-made. Like right. she can't, she, it, she, it, she can't help the fact that she was born where she was. Correct. You make the best of wherever you are. She wasn't. Isn't that better, isn't that better than a lot of these rich kids of on the course. upper side that yes. are spending their parents' money and not working at all and partying? Yep. That's true. She works hard and doesn't Although party. I think she party. She, yeah. <laughs> Maybe she party. Do you party, I, no, my, no. I, I'm, I'm so lame. You can't you on notice. your hours. What time do you wake up? I wake up at midnight. Yeah. I party at like 2 p.m. It's okay. awesome. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. Embattled R&B star R. Kelly explodes during his first interview since being charged with sexual abuse. Watch this. But just use your common sense. How stupid would it be for me to, with my crazy past and what I've been through. Oh, right now I just think I need to be a monster and hold girls against their will. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Mm. R. Kelly is out on bail after pleading not guilty to 10 counts of sexual abuse. Some of his alleged victims were minors. The CBS interview airs this morning. A potentially landmark decision recognizing an aborted fetus as a person. An Alabama judge ruling a would-be father has the legal right to sue the abortion clinic that terminated his girlfriend's pregnancy. He says he wanted to have the baby while the mother did not. It's believed to be the first case of its kind in the country. Take a look at this. A huge slab of plywood smashes right through a driver's windshield. Christopher Matheson says he is lucky to be alive. I think I have a little, a little pinprick in the middle of my forehead. I got really, I think I got really, really lucky. I think I was really lucky that nobody hit their brakes in front of me and nobody kind of plowed into me from behind. Hmm. Yeah, look at that. The plywood stopping just a few inches from his face after it flew off a truck in Seattle. He walked away with scratches and splinters. Look at that damage. Okay, we all know police bust bad guys, right? But watch as one officer busts a move. That's Officer Floyd Trust getting down with a woman in South Carolina. The Georgetown Police Department says she often helps out with an exercise program for the elderly. Isn't that cute? Gotta love it. Janice has moves like that, but hers are like <laughs> yeah. well, better. Uh, but see, though, they were inside, and Janice is outside on the streets of New York City where it's cold again today. Do it to keep warm. Yeah, there you go. Ooh, I love a man Janice. in uniform and a man in uniform that dances. I mean, you bonus. You married right. a man. I did. He does doesn't he dance. dance for you? No, he does not. No, <laughs> Sean. But that's okay. On. I'll forgive him. Uh, you know what? It is so cold out here. It is cold in New York. It is cold down south. Let's take a look at it. We actually have freeze warnings in effect for parts of the Gulf Coast where it is 33 in Houston, 29 in Dallas. There are your freeze warnings from Texas all the way to the Panhandle up towards the Carolinas. Uh, That means a period of time of below freezing temperatures. New York City, here we are. Today is your 28 degree high, but then things will start to bump up as we get through the next few days. The West Coast, more heavy rain and mountain snow for you. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, great for the skiers. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for coming out. Uh, and that will continue to move in towards the central U.S. over the next couple of days. The rest of the country, by the way, mostly sunny. Get it? Hello? We do. We got we it. Do get it. Got it. That's yes. the name of Janice's book. Came Thank out you. yesterday. Check it out. It's fantastic. Thanks, guys. All right. Congratulations. Mostly sunny. Yay. There it is right there. You can get sunny. it right now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere. Very cool. All right. Coming up. And it was sunny yesterday, Floor. I was walking I was walking with, with Hayden on the sidewalk. I was like, God, you were so good. It's sunny, and her book, Mostly Sunny, came out. I thought it was mostly sunny. <laughs> it's no it longer right right completely it, sunny. It's it. never going to be partly completely cloudy. Right. It's always going to be mostly sunny. As it That's, should be. Yeah, you're right. Okay. It should be. Full. All right. Come All right. Uh, AOC denying allegations of missing campaign cash, but how much trouble could she be facing? Ocasio Cortez firing back against allegations of funneling campaign do- donations to avoid reporting them to the federal government. There is no violation, so there's no violation. Do you think that's a sign of you taking dark money? Oh, no. No. I'm 100% Thank you. 
Okay, so what kind of trouble could she face and her chief of staff as well? Attorney Mark Fitzgibbons is an expert in fundraising law and policy. He joins us now to break it all down. Mark, good morning to you. Good morning, Steve. Okay, so the headline yesterday was that uh, uh, AOC's chief of staff ran a $1 million slush fund by diverting campaign cash to a couple of companies that he controlled. That's the story as we understand it. Is that the problem? That's part of the problem, and let me also start out by saying it's no irony that uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez role-played the bad guy in hearings last month about regulating uh, campaign finance even more. The, the issue is uh, there were political action committees, tax-exempt political action committees, and for-profit companies that Mr. Chakrabarty ran. Uh, and it appears to be there was a shell game of money going back and forth. Uh, one week, the for-profit company had all of the employees and was providing all of the services. The next week, it was the political action committee. So the uh, political action committee also had the same name as mm -hmm. the for-profit company, and that seems like it was designed to create confusion. But it's money going back and forth, plus potentially the big problem for Chakrabarty is the coordination issue because uh, he was the agent for both her uh, campaign committee mm -hmm. and other PACs that were uh, have involved in this transfer of money. Now, he uh, worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign. I mean, he's a guy who's been around the block, has made millions of dollars in the uh, online world and whatnot. You would think he would know the, the rules. But generally, stuff like this just results in a fine, although yesterday they were talking about a, a potential of jail time. Yeah, the, the, the fine will probably apply to the shell game of the money, and uh, Mr. Chakrabarty does know campaign finance law. He wrote about it extensively on the website's uh, 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 page, and he identifies what he was doing. Right. And it does look like a shell game, but the issue, again, is the, the potential criminality of this coordination since he was agent right. for her campaign and these other PACs. Well, and the hypocrisy, because she was, you know, when she was running she was all about transparency and then when you uh, pull the curtain back and you see oh hey, wait a minute your words it looks like a shell game was going on here there's not the kind of transparency people were thinking they were getting she's a socialist crusader she doesn't know the rules she wants to make life difficult for everybody else but uh, it's, it's very apparent she does not know the rules because it, it looks like she violated him and her campaign violated them. Well, let's see what happens. All right, uh, Mark Fitzgibbons, we thank you very much for joining us today from D.C. explaining what happened. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Steve. All right. Ten minutes now before the top of the hour. It was supposed to be a relaxing getaway. It's supposed to be electronic data keeping for patient care, mm -hmm. but it also... It sounds it goes, great. It sounds great, but it goes beyond that. It's actually data collecting. And so mm -hmm. you're finding physicians, you see them clicking all the time and they're not even looking at yeah. you anymore. That's because they have to do about 30 clicks during that visit. So it's a headache. Oh, it's, it's beyond a headache. But now what we're seeing is that we're having some more problems with it. One, you have less face time with your doctor, but they're showing several studies came out in 2018 showing somewhere around 550 patient errors may have been due to the input of EHRs. The problem is there are gag clauses in these contracts, which are very, which are legal. Yeah. When you, especially with software intelligence, you can have gag clauses where if there's a problem with the technology, you're not able to report it. But right. the problem is when we're talking about patient care, yeah. So those, those are the problems. So what can patients do about it? Well, you know, President Trump actually is kind of taking this on his own right now. He has proposed a new rule, which is going to make these electronic health records actually be patient data. So those with Medicare, Medicaid, and hopefully the VA at some point, they will have access to their own records and they can keep tabs on things. The most common um, error that they showed in those studies was possibly patient dosing errors, medication errors, especially in children. So yeah. when it comes to people to stay on top of things, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist, make sure you're taking what's been prescribed and it's the right dose amount. So you may not be, you're not the medical, well, meaning you are the medical expert, but <laughs> the, the, the patient is not the medical expert, no. but even being able to see your own records, you're going to maybe recognize something that isn't just right. Well, possibly. Look, the government is ill-suited to steer technology, and that's what happened with mm. the EHR, with the ACA. So we need to, although we want the government to step in to make sure everyone has access to this, 
we need to take away some of the governmental influence to make these private companies, they need to make this technology better. We can't be having these errors. And as long as they are protected by these gag clauses and still receiving taxpayer subsidies for their product, what's the incentive to get better? Great point. All right. Exactly. Nobody would know better than you. Thanks, exactly. guys. Appreciate Thank it. you. Okay. On Instagram is what you're saying. I think right. that's and, it. Exactly. Yeah. That's the key. And you need a family that has a reality show. Yeah. I mean, you, you, can, be, you can be both highly advantaged and self-made at the same time, which I think sure. is exactly what she's got. All right. I think we're all doing just fine. We're going to tell happy you about with my life. But people <laughs> yeah. are steamed that she's talking about right. being self-made, that she has risen to the billionaire status. We'll yes. explain yes. that in this block. But we start. Yes. Yeah, show them the newspaper, the headline of the, Washington, of the New York Post this morning, because you did that in the first hour. Look at that. Breaking point. And that takes us to our top story this morning. There's a crisis down at the southern border reaching that breaking point, like the newspaper says. Brand new numbers from the Customs and Border Patrol Agency show a record surge of illegal immigration into the U.S. Still, with more than 76,000 people trying to cross our border just last month. Think about that. 76,000 people just last month. Griff Jenkins joins us from D.C. Griff, these numbers are jaw-dropping. Yeah, they are, guys. They're staggering. I spent a lot of time with the Border Patrol officials, and they say it's unsustainable, and it's an onslaught they haven't seen in more than a decade. If you look at one specific group, family units, a 300% increase compared to last year. Already, you've got hundred more than 136,000 uh, apprehended at our southwest border, which exceeds the total number of more than 107,000 in all of fiscal year 2018. In those large groups, caravans that I've covered, there have been 70 large large groups of 100 or more migrants totaling more than 12,000 apprehensions compared to only 13 groups last year and only two in 2017. And more are on the way. Mexico's Interior Secretary Olga Cordero, who was in Washington last week, warns they're on pace to deal with more than 700,000 Central American migrants alone this year. Here is how CBP's commissioner put it yesterday. Based on the experiences of men and women on the front line, this is clearly both a border security and humanitarian crisis. The system is well beyond capacity and remains at a breaking point. Meanwhile, a vote in the Senate nears with enough Republican defections to block the president's national emergency declaration. Democrats still oppose the use of military funds for a border wall. Devoting OCO funds to a useless reckless vanity project at the border would betray our national security and our commitment to our men and women in uniform. The administration is out in full force. Secretary Nielsen testifying before a House Homeland uh, Security Committee today at 10. And you have CBP's Commissioner McAleenan up in the Senate. We'll see if their efforts change anybody's minds. Guys? Thank you, you very much, Appreciate Griff. It, Griff. You know, you wonder why these numbers are so high now, and many of them probably are being told the president's going to build this wall. If you want to go in, you got to go in now. And in the last hour, we cho we showed you some of these numbers. If you compare, you know, the, with the with the new president, Donald Trump, now two years in, the laws are actually being enforced, and that is why we see such a huge number because the apprehensions are through the roof. That's right. We had Robert Perez on the program earlier, deputy commissioner of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and we asked him his take on the current situation. Listen. Through this fiscal year alone, um, more than half of the entirety of the populations of uh, uh, migrants coming and being apprehended along our border are made up of family units. What that in sum does to us at the border, it is uh, overwhelming an immigration system that was never designed uh, to deal with that type of population, deal with that types of numbers. You know, the other thing is uh, these kind of numbers make the president's point. There is a humanitarian crisis at our southern border. 76,000 people. I, I grew up in a town of, of, of 5,000. Mm -hmm. Me too. That is so much bigger than our town and all the towns in our county and in the area. But 76,000 crossed the border illegally just in one, in one month. month. That's a crisis. And it makes the president's point. We've got to do and something. And as with any crisis, border. just like any problem, the longer you ignore it, the worse it gets. It gathers and gathers and gets mm -hmm. bigger and bigger. Which, it, The longer the Democrats deny it, the more their denial is going to be ridiculous as the crisis gets bigger and the emergency more clear to the American people. Speaking of denial, 
<laughs> AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's denying the watchdog's complaint that her, her chief of staff funneled almost a million dollars from uh, these PACs into uh, his own companies. Yep. She says there's no violation. Listen. So do you have any comment on the FEC violation uh, filed against your office? Uh, there is no violation, so there's no violation. Do you think that's a sign of you taking the dark money? Oh, no. No. So that was uh, Fox News' uh, Caroline McKee at Reagan Airport. That's right. AOC was at the airport. Flying Even, th a plane? even though she's talking about uh, we need to take high-speed rail, she was taking the Delta shuttle, it looks to like. To New York. Last time I checked, there's a pretty robust line well, between D.C. and New York. Well, and the reporter said that. Why train. are you taking a plane and not, not taking the high train? And she said, because that would be wasting my constituents' time. So, uh, <laughs> so, oh, anyway, so now she's a she, capitalist with her own time. But you know what? She's been a champion of high-speed rail, and there is high-speed rail between like, Washington and New York and oftentimes yeah. it's faster to take the train than the plane. So a corporate, a group filed an FEC complaint because what effectively her campaign was doing, diverting campaign cash to companies controlled by her campaign manager, a shell allegedly. game of money between PACs and private right. companies, allegedly, this is what they're alleging, so they could obfuscate or hide where the money was truly going. Right. That seems like dark money to me. That's the whole point of when she was running for president. She was talking about how, look, when people, when what? Oh, I, did I say running for president? Um, <laughs> well, yes, she, you did. No, she no, was all in the head of She'd be running you. for president. <laughs> but when she was running for Congress, she made it very clear there's got to be transparency in the elections. Oh, and God. now it's just so ironic. Watch this. This really speaks to the corrupting force of money and politics in general. Mm -hmm. And this problem is not going to go away until we tighten the reins on the role of money in politics. I really hope that we really pass, introduce and pass very strong legislation that's going to put much stronger limits on how special interests and how uh, money can be moved, especially when they interface with campaigns. Okay, so that was a couple of weeks after she was elected mm -hmm. president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> elected Congress. Now, this is a big accusation that her chief of staff would be involved in the shell game, as has been alleged. And yet, when you look at the network coverage of these accusations, uh, Newsbusters put it together, the Media Research Center. They looked, I believe, at the morning shows and at the evening newscast. Not one second of that story was covered on ABC, CBS, or NBC. So if you're getting all your news from those networks, you don't even know about this story. You're ignoring the, the miss I'm of the people shell game packs between companies. And, I mean, having been in that world before, you know what you're doing building different entities, moving money in different places. It's to avoid something, either taxes or disclosure. Something's going on there. Well, and this uh, chief of staff actually worked for Bernie Sanders when was on his campaign, oh, yeah. knows the law, according to Mark Fitzgibbons, an attorney who is an expert in this area of law. It appears to be there was a shell game of money going back and forth uh, one week, the for-profit company had all of the employees and was providing all of the services. The next week, it was the political action committee. She's a socialist crusader. She doesn't know the rules. She wants to make life difficult for everybody else. But uh, it's, it's very apparent she does not know the rules because it, it looks like she violated them and her campaign violated them. And they may have violated them. We'll find out. The, the, the other thing is the hypocrisy of this. It's one thing to do it if it's legal. It's another thing to do it when you said you weren't going to do anything like that. I'm just a candidate of the people. If you say, hey, I'll take PAC money or I'll do this or I'll do mm -hmm. that, then it's all fine if it's all legal. It's the hypocrisy of saying, well, I'll do it, but I'll tell everybody else they can't. We'll find out. We'll get to the bottom of this and see what really matters because the other networks aren't. Okay. All right. Jillian has some headlines for us. Hey, Jillian. That's right. Good morning to you. Hope you're having a good morning so far at home. Protests erupt during a city council meeting in the wake of the latest Stefan Clark decision. One protester even jumping on top of a podium earlier. Now, that's Wrong video. We'll get to that in a second. California's. So, what is this all about? Tell us what Jesus Freak is. 
Yeah, it's one of these crazy comic books. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's a situation where kids are going to read this, and, and that's the disturbing part. Uh, look, apparently, uh, Jesus, according to this comic book, has some issues, and so th decides to take it out in a violent way with his sword. Look, he here's the deal. Uh, Jesus is a superhero, not this superhero. He's a superhero that's all-powerful and who saves. Uh, and Ainsley, the good news here is that this is fiction. Could you imagine if it was nonfiction? But it's fiction. The nonfiction version is actually actually very bloody as well, but it's bloody on the cross for mm -hmm. Jesus who died for all of us. And I think that's the important thing. He died for all of us, paid for our sins, and that's the comic book that people should be reading. But guess what? It's not a comic book. It's yeah. the Bible. He's not a killer. He's a savior, right? That's How do Christians right. level this playing field? Well, look, I think Christian television, first of all, and when I say television, let me be specific, actual films that we've seen that rise in popularity throughout the years. Uh, so I think that's really important. There has been a pushback on that front uh, for sure. And so I think you see that. But look, this has been going on a very long time, uh, Ainsley. Uh, you can go back to when uh, the Supreme Court removed uh, Bible reading from school, prayer mm -hmm. in school. Remember back in the day, the Supreme Court decision about wanting to remove God from the Pledge of Allegiance? I mean... The Last Temptation of Christ, we've seen that in the movies, that was blasphemous. We've even seen uh, a photograph from an artist, actually, where he took a photograph of the cross and dipped it in a vat of urine. Look, Jesus has been depicted so many different horrible ways in this, in this country. The question is, are Christians going to speak up and fight back? You do that with the power of the purse, literally. I'm talking the almighty dots of marijuana. This academic year, 183 marijuana warning cards have already been issued. While parents are notified of the infraction, nothing remains on a student's permanent record. The department's softened pot policy among students has led to a 192% plunge in weed-related New York City Police Department summonses in the last three months of 2018. Here with the discussion, we've got the author of Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana, Kevin Savet. He's screening left, and Dan Goldman, the founder of New York Cannabis Alliance and the host of Marijuana Today podcast. Guys, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Kevin, you, you have a problem that now in yeah. New York City public schools, if kids are caught with pot, they don't get in trouble, really. Well, here's the thing. I mean, today's marijuana is not your Woodstock weed. It's 10 to 30 times stronger. It's being put in vaporized cartridges, the jewels, uh, and it's an epidemic. It, and it, it affects your developing brain. You know, the brain is developing until age 30. So, look, I don't want to throw ki a kid in jail or expel him for a year if he, has a, if he has a joint in his pocket, but we have to get serious about marijuana. Many of these kids need help. This is a health issue, and we should not be encouraging in this right. environment more drug use. Dan? I mean, I agree. We want to discourage adolescents from using cannabis, but the way to do that is to give them actual, honest information based on science and facts and evidence and allow young people to make healthy decisions, as we've seen when... Well, when you listen to his science, it, it would scare people from using pot. Well, that's what we want. We want to delay the onset of adolescent okay. use, but we want to do that by giving them honest information, not the dare propaganda that people like Kevin and his colleagues in the Prohibitionist <laughs> Office of National Drug Control <laughs> Policy promote. Yeah. Young people, when they're given accurate information, as we've seen in legal states like Colorado and Washington reduce their use. Yeah. Youth rates drop when states legalize marijuana. Actually, so this is like Big Tobacco's dream. Big Tobacco, Altria is getting into the marijuana business and actually youth use and especially 18 to 25 year old use has gone way up in legalized states. Today's marijuana is linked to mental illness, three times the risk of suicide, schizophrenia mm -hmm. and psychosis. I don't want to give them scare tactics, but every major medical association <laughs> agrees that we should discourage use and not legalize. But we need to slow the train down. Here, here's the thing. We're talking about about a discipline problem yeah. in our schools. Yeah. It's not just that they're breaking a local right. rule. Right. Pot is still a federal felony. Well, and right. it hurts your ability to learn in school, and it hurts other kids' ability to do that. This isn't about a couple of kids, you know, in the boys' room passing around a joint. We're talking 90% THC in these cartridges. It's a totally <laughs> different ball game. We need to do more than just a slap on the wrist yeah, and forget Dan, about it. Dan, if somebody, if, Dan if, if, if somebody came to school with a bottle of vodka, yeah. you would think that they would get in trouble. But we wouldn't call the police on them, and we certainly wouldn't saddle them with an arrest and a conviction that will ruin their chances to get financial aid for college and to pursue a healthy career that will allow them to flourish and become a productive citizen. I think there's a citizen. middle ground between we have arresting and putting them in prison or just kind of giving them a card that's meaningless and saying, go home. We need to do awareness, education. There's so much normalization because of legalization. Th this has gone so far, so fast, and we're not giving kids accurate information. The only way to give that accurate information is when there's legalization. While we continue to promote 
promote the idea that cannabis is some dangerous drug that needs to be prohibited at the risk of jail and prison for young people, we give them misinformation, give them accurate information about their developing brains, and you see young people make healthy decisions in the states that are legal. We, we wouldn't legalize heroin to give kids accurate information about heroin, though. We don't need to do that in order to give them accurate info. We've got a statement from the New York City uh, Department of Education. They say, New York City is the safest big city in America because of the work of our New York City police officers, including those in our schools charged with deciding how to appropriately handle kids smoking pot. It is this smart discretion of New York City police officers that has fueled a 29% reduction in crime in our schools. Well, you know, if, if you don't consider possession of marijuana a, a problem, a crime, no it's wonder not the laws be in New York well, State actually, very soon. Well, but, well, actually, what happens is even when you don't, it's a crime, but you have public use has skyrocketed. Uh, 611 calls in New York City. Everyone is complaining because of the smell. This is not a good en environment for schools. Again, we don't need to legalize something to educate kids about it. That doesn't make but any Dan, sense. But right Except now in the United States, illegal. majority of Americans are for legalization of pot. That's right. A great and growing number are for legalization. Not because more Americans are using cannabis, but because more Americans Way look, more are using. Because more Americans are looking at the laws regarding cannabis and are choosing not to shadow people with criminal penalties. You say there's a middle ground between criminal penalties yeah. and uh, a slap on the wrist, these warning cards, but you don't ever suggest what it is. And when you're given the well, opportunity to support policies that would not allow for the big yeah. tobacco and big alcohol to enter marijuana, you don't support those policies. Actually, the reason... You, well, hold you on, hold on. Vermont, Hold on. The reason why you post the reason why, well, one, one second. the reason why no state has legalized marijuana through the legislature, which is a really yet. important point. Yet. No state has. Hold on, is because we've offered. For hold on, is because we've. Well, they did not retail sales. Is because right, we've but offered. But you still oppose that middle, position. Hold on, we've offered a middle ground that says we don't want to saddle people with a criminal record and throw them in prison. I don't want to do okay. that either. But we don't want to create let, big tobacco for pot, which is exactly what's but happening. But you oppose Washington D.C., which avoided commercial sales, and you oppose the system in Vermont, which avoids commercial yeah. sales. When given the opportunity to support a policy that would avoid We've the outcome policy. of big alcohol and big tobacco entering the cannabis space, your okay. organization is nowhere to be found, the, Kevin. The issue Listen, is the, the two of you did a very good job <laughs> presenting your various points of views. Let's see what happens here in New Thank you. Thank and you. elsewhere. All right, guys, thank you. Meanwhile, I, you. Thank you. Thank you. I know you two are incredibly proud, but I, I'm going to start with Isaac. Uh, okay, you were asleep five before your match <laughs> someone nudged you and oh, they would put the dvd or the whatever it was vhs, VHS. on the other on side, the other side right. the metal yeah. detector mm -hmm. but the most heartbreaking thing was it's like oh there's the movie i want and just as you get there somebody goes <laughs> <laughs> or you could make, ah! the, make the person at the register if you really was if you were really nice to him go out and check the box yes has out someone recently lot. returned someone it returned it was a fun time to go to the it was, it was, co it was complicated there. It was oh fun. it's a one day rental well, I'm going to have to have it back. <laughs> I can't watch it tonight. Uh, now we can watch things on our phone. And, now, and everyone we else. We can watch it on our watch, too. I'm All right. Can... Meanwhile, Puxatawney Phil is wanted. Police agencies across the United States releasing posters to find him. They want to put him in Groundhog Jail for lying about an early <laughs> spring. Yes, he sure did. Because Janice Dean was in Puxatani for Phil's prediction. Janice, what happened? You could be an accessory. I, am I an accomplice? Yes. Are. are they going to come and arrest me? I am wearing orange today, you will uh, notice. <laughs> I look great in orange. <laughs> and it looks like I have bars behind me. Incredible. Uh, as soon as you hear the siren, you know I'm in trouble. Let's take a look at the maps. It is cold outside. That poor groundhog is going to be arrested. Uh, 29 is your daytime high, 30 in Chicago, mostly sunny for much of the country. And then we have a storm system that's going to move into the west and bring more heavy rain and mountain snow. So this is the one that's going to perhaps move across the next couple of days over the central U.S. and bring the snow for the northern plains and the upper Midwest. <laughs> it's so cold outside. My mouth is frozen. Oh, and there they are. I'm ready. I'm That's ready. right. Janice, here comes your ride. <laughs> well, I've heard that before. We take care of our veterans. We're working so hard on this. We're making so much progress. Veterans are America's greatest national treasure. They kept us safe, and we're going to keep them safe. President Trump is taking action to help uh, signing an executive order, creating a task force to come up with solutions to end the problem of suicide amongst veterans. Still too big, still ongoing. 
Joining me now, retired U.S. Army Sergeant Nick Armendaris and Army Sergeant First Class Robert Muscle. Thank you, gentlemen, both for joining me this morning. Really appreciate it. Um, Sergeant, let me, Sergeant Nick, let me start with you. You were at that ceremony. You know, it, you know the, the stat is well known. 22 veterans previously, now 20, they say. We don't know exactly how many committing suicide every day. A huge epidemic. Uh, are, we go, are we doing enough at the White House to, to confront this? Uh, absolutely. I think that this is a first step and it's a major step to be taken in the, the right direction. You know, it, o it opens up a lot more pathways and a lot more doors to this crisis and this kind of epidemic that's going on along throughout the country. And it's just they're, they're doing great things. It was a crisis then. It still is. You know, Sergeant First Class Muscle, you're still in. Uh, you're with guys still serving. Is this a crisis you're seeing uh, from the active component as well? So uh, absolutely, it, it is. Um, but it is something that the you know the community itself, the Department of Defense, the the uh, the Army is really combating, uh, and in collaboration with with uh, all the agencies uh, and now the private sector. So I, I think the focus and uh, um, really with this executive order, the focus of all these different agencies mm -hmm. combined, we're really going to combat this uh, this epidemic of veteran suicide. Sergeant Muscle, let me start with you because some <laughs> veterans are starting an initiative called Operation Resiliency. You're a part of it. It's part of the Independence Fund, Fund Joint Program with the VA. It reunites high-risk combat units, so guys that have been in these high-intensity high environments. Where did you come up with this idea to begin with? So to, to, to be clear, it wasn't it wasn't my idea. Um, the the Independence Fund, in collaboration with the v Department of Veterans Affairs, so uh, w where the inception of this this uh, came about, and back in September, we were at a funeral uh, for for a fellow member from our company. His name is Derek Hill, and at the end of that funeral, the uh, the director of the Independence Fund, or the CEO of the Independence Fund, decided to make a phone call to the Department of Veterans Affairs, and and uh, decide how do we curb this? How do we stop veteran suicide? Uh, and between the two. Operation Resiliency really came about from that, uh, and, and you're right. That's absolutely what it does. It takes at-risk at risk units that 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 uh, while deployed were in very kinetic environments uh, that faced um, a, a high level of uh, casualties, high casualty and, rates, and things like that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and uh, you know once once they came home. Um, they reintegrated into into they society. They went to as well, yeah, absolutely to different places. And Nick, so this is about peer to peer counseling. The guys you served with know you best. Exactly. So, and I think uh, that type of counseling overall, it seems to work best. It seems to be more functional between each other because, I mean, we're all brothers. We were all brothers doing the same thing uh, while we were deployed and to come back and kind of have that cohesiveness again and camaraderie built back up within us again is, uh, I think it's, it, it it's definitely the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Nick and Robert, thank you very much, both of you, for your service. Listen, I talk to, I still hear from folks all the time. This is, remains a massive problem. Guys, don't, don't find the purpose when they come home. Connecting with their peers is a big part of the solution. Thanks for what you're doing. We're going to stay on this story. All right. Well, did you hear about this? A college dean resigning because her school banned Chick-fil-A. One of her former students is praising that move, and they join us. A New Jersey college dean has resigned over her school's Chick-fil-A ban because she says she couldn't support the university opposing Chick-fil-A's religious values. Well, our next guest is a senior at Ryder University and was in Dean Newman's class when the school rejected Chick-fil-A. His name's Alex Solomon, and he's also the president of the Ryder University Republican Club. Good morning to you, Alex. Thanks Good for morning. Us. Thank well, you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> what was your reaction to that you were in her class? Correct. And when she decided to step down, your reaction? So 
First, I was surprised that she decided to step down. Um, she decided to step down a few weeks ago, but until recently, we didn't know the reason why. And then when I found out the reason why, I was even sadder that she decided to step down because she was such an asset to the university as a dean and has done so many great things for our College of Business. Uh, the, the university put out a statement. Uh, we maintain the decision about choosing an on-campus restaurant franchise was in no way a judgment on religious values. Rather, our intention was to foster a sense of respect and belonging to all members of the campus community, including those who identify as LGBTQ+. Uh, you have a problem with uh, Chick-fil-A not being open on Sunday. Mm -hmm. and using peanut oil with the french fries and stuff like that but for them to say we don't want chick-fil-a because